So tonight is kind of what we consider the final draft. Um, we're going to present this. We're going to have some discussion here. And then we'll be getting together tomorrow morning to kind of go through some of the things that have been discussed here and whether that needs to be included in that draft and have a final report and completed. Um, and then at the end of this presentation, we'll also discuss what we think as a staff should be the next steps in this plan uh, to move forward um, with this plan for the community. So uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Tom Deal and he's gonna take it from here. Thank you, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, first, I just wanna commend the town of Colchester. We had a great team to work with and it's been a very enjoyable project and I think we've learned a lot and I think we have a great plan. So uh, basically, we came here to do a, a needs assessment and a master plan to look at whether there was a need for a community health and wellness recreation center. And we also came to do a master plan for, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and we also came to do a master plan for uh, Bayside Park and the Hazlet property. So basically, the purpose of the plans to come up with recommendations as to whether the community believed there needed to be some form of a, uh, what the needs were uh, in maintaining the natural resources of the area and the character of the town, uh, determine if there was a need for a community center, uh, and if so, what were the programming and uh, facility components that there would be, and to come up with a plan for a vibrant year-round Bayside Park and uh, to integrate the town owned Bayside Hagslet uh, property with Bayside Park plans in the school campus. I'm not gonna talk too much about the process. We, most people are aware, but we had a very thorough process all the way from a project kickoff, public engagement, we did market assessment, site analysis. We came previously into the findings presentation and then we've done conceptual <coughs> amenities feedback, and we'll get into everything else uh, in this discussion. So we looked at uh, the town of Colchester and some of the key demographics. Um, your population in, in between 2015 and 2020 is expected to continue to grow. Um, the 65 to 74 year old age group is roughly going to be 10% of your community. Uh, the baby boomers, the 45 to 64 year olds, are expected to be 25%. And the millennial generation, the 16 to 36 year olds, expected to be 31%. And your media household income is expected to increase by $11,600 during that four year stretch. We also looked at national trends for park and recreation. Um, what we're finding is Towns are looking for community, public spaces, festivals, areas that everyone can gather. And that's something that's very important to the millennials. Uh, baby boomers are redefining recreation and leisure. They're looking for more than the old box gym with a little weight stack. They're looking for fitness programs, outdoors, arts, cultural events. Um, and in our industry, and in Glenn's industry, uh, the park and recreation agencies have all been surveyed, and 69% of the agencies that were surveyed have plans to either build a new facility, renovate an existing facility, or put on additions. So what you're considering is right with the right trends. Um, another trend is a community one-stop uh, indoor recreation, something that's going to be your community hub that would contain all of the elements that you need and it will meet the requirements for all ages. Young children, middle age, adults, teens, the whole family. Uh, an advantage of doing this, it helps with increased cost recovery, promotes retention, and it increases cross usage. If you have a facility and people are coming to it and there's more than one thing to do, they're more likely to do all the other things that are involved. They'll also tell others that I went to the community recreation center and I didn't realize they had this. So that person then will come and take a look and do that or other activities. Um, parks are also considered an economic development strategy. Uh, when you have nice parks 
and nice facilities and nice programs. You bring tourism in, more people from your area go there. There's equipment that they buy to use the facilities. Um, they're more likely to go to local uh, vendors and restaurants and things like that. So hopefully you're aware we did a, a survey. Um, we mailed out uh, 3,200 3, surveys. Uh, 3,141 were actually delivered. There were a few bad addresses. We received over 469 surveys back, and that's a 14.6% response rate, so that's very good. The things that we heard from the survey, 63%, an indoor pool is, a very, is the most important amenity, 61% uh, exercise room, 60% exercise equipment, and that would be weight equipment, cardiovascular equipment, treadmills, ellipticals, things like that, and 53% rated a gymnasium for basketball, volleyball, all the indoor court sports, pickleball were all identified. And 50% of the respondents indicated they'd be more likely to increase their use of Bayside Park if there was more to Bayside Park than what currently exists. So if there were more amenities there, more facilities there, they'd be more likely to go to Bayside Park. We looked at uh, some of the priorities for the future. The, the graph might be a little bit uh, difficult to reach from a distance, but the, the most important priority for future facilities was an indoor pool, followed up by exercise equipment, the gymnasium, and exercise rooms. And we did look at everything that was graded there and considered that in our conceptual designs. When we came, we were uh, told to look at five different sites to evaluate uh, for the potential of uh, a community recreation center. And the top three sites that were identified from that were Bayside Park, the Bayside Hazlet property, and Severance Quarters. We took a look at um, putting together a budget for a community Recreation Center, and we looked at it in three phases. I'll talk about it a little bit more in a moment, but we had phase one was an outdoor aquatic center. Phase two was where you have the outdoor aquatic center and you build next to it the community center. And then phase three is where you come back and cover the outdoor aquatic center and make it an indoor aquatic center. And what we did here is we looked at what were the anticipated total expenses and what would be your possible cost recovery. So if you just had an outdoor aquatic center, your expenses are approximately $350,000 a year. That's not for building the facility, that's the operating expenses, staffing, uh, utilities, maintenance, things like that. We believe you could have a revenue through membership sales and rentals and, and user fees and programs of 166000 uh, So your cost recovery would be about 48% you'd recover of, the, of your operating. When you go to add phase two, which is a community center, um, your total expenses go up to you know, a little over a million dollars, but your total revenue goes up to a million two hundred thousand dollars because you could sell more memberships and have more programs and, and more usage. And uh, potentially you could have a cost recovery of 121%. So you'd actually bring in more money than you're expending in expenses. When you come and you uh, do phase three and you cover the pool, um, your total expenses go up a bit because now the pool is open year round as opposed to just the summer months. Um, your revenue will increase some more and uh, you won't quite have the same cost recovery. A pool is an expensive endeavor and you'll gain memberships but not six months more memberships. Um, so our recommendation as we looked at all of this and talked to the, the staff we were working with, uh, we felt was to build a community recreation center at Bayside Park and to do it in three phases. As I just mentioned, and there's some pictures up right over here, 
and we'll show you pictures in a second. There, the first phase would be an outdoor pool with a support facility, locker rooms and an entrance, and a little bit of maintenance area. Uh, phase two would be the community recreation center with a gym and fitness amenities. And then phase three, come back and cover the outdoor pool with the structure to attach and match it to the community center. So the plan would be when you're building that phase one, you're preparing it to have a roof so that it's a fairly simple thing. Um, the other project we were working on was the Bayside Park recommendations. Uh, we recommend to transform Bayside Park and the nearby Bayside Hazlet land into an all-in-one-place exceptional park and recreation experience. Uh, combine all the desired amenities that we had identified throughout the public input and uh, uh, the surveys in the most cost-effective manner. If we, if you put uh, the community recreation center at Bayside Park and enhance Bayside Park, there's a lot of cost savings in staffing and uh, uh, some utility things and uh, infrastructure. Some of the things that were considered at Bayside Park, and there's a, a diagram here, and I'll put one up in just a second. Things like on the bay side, adding an amphitheater and a lake house, uh, some green spaces, to have a tunnel under the road, a connector, and on the upper bay side park, to have things like a skate park and a meadow and uh, indoor outdoor water features, the community recreation center, and with the uh, Hazlet property, volleyball, pickleball courts, tennis educational play, all the things that you see up there. And we would still have the athletic fields. And a huge thing for that we'd have would be walking trails, which is great for socialization and is really the number one exercise people are doing. So we gave you some information on the Community Recreation Center facility cost estimate. This is what we believe it would cost to construct it may be a little bit hard to read uh, the outdoor aquatics the total budget to build the outdoor aquatics in today's dollars is estimated to be seven million eight hundred and five thousand dollars when you get to phase two in today's dollars the total budget for that would be thirteen million two hundred and fifty four dollars and when you get to phase three the total budget for phase three in today's dollar is four million four hundred thirty-eight thousand. The overall total project in today's dollars is twenty-five million, roughly five hundred thousand dollars. Here is a picture of a uh, conceptual plan of phase one. Uh, the four-lane left pool is outdoors. It's a rectangular pool. Uh, you could teach swimming lessons in there. People could do water exercise. People could swim for activity. You could do water polo, all kinds of things. Next to it is the outdoor activity pool. That would have potentially one to two lanes that could be used for teaching. It would have warmer water. Um, it has many other features. It would be a zero entry area where you can walk in and the water is very, very not deep at all. and you can become very comfortable, it's wonderful for children. You would find that families would go there and spend a lot of time in an outdoor activity pool. And it's kind of like a gateway into the lap pool. There's a patio, potential slide, some locker rooms, uh, a party room so you could have some rentals, and an entry. When we get to phase two, uh, the pool is still there, it's still outside. You'd expand your locker rooms a little bit, expand the lobby. You would potentially build a gymnasium, uh, administrative area. You have some community rooms, some kid zones, adventure area, and a fitness studio on the first floor, and multiple patios on the outside. And as we get a little bit farther, Axel will talk about the positioning and the view of, of the bay and everything. The second floor of the uh, fitness or the uh, community recreation center it would have a suspended running track, walking track, jogging track that would go around the outside of the gymnasium and there'd also be fitness and weight equipment. And then when you came to uh, phase three, you would actually 
cover or enclose the outdoor pools and they would become indoor. It would be done in such a manner that there would be doors and walls that could open so you could still access the outside during the appropriate time of year. Um, and the second floor doesn't change very much in the, in the plan. When we look at Bayside Park, we gave you a cost estimate and we looked at Bayside Park in three segments. There was Bayside Park lower area, that's on the other side of the road. There's Bayside Park upper area and there is the Hazlitt area. And what we came up with, uh, these are your construction costs with some design contingencies. Uh, the subtotal for the Bayside Park lower area was approximately $5,580,000 in today's dollars. The Bayside Park upper area was approximately $5,900,000. And the, the Hazlitt area was approximately $2,160,000 thousand dollars in today's dollars. The total combined project at Bayside Park would be thirteen million six hundred and seventy thousand dollars approximately. And we were asked to give it to you in phases. If some way you did it all at one time, the cost could change, there could be some cost savings, and there, there's nothing to say that you have to do that one first or this. And we've also given Glenn and everyone on that team much more detail that we you know, don't put in a typical PowerPoint that shows you all the different things. So you can actually do parts of do parts of lower or parts of the upper. Okay. And here is a conceptual drawing of it. And uh, Axel, if it's all right with you, I'll let you talk about this and then we'll go on to your section. Okay. This is actual, the Axel Bishop. Hi, I'm Axel Bishop. Is this on? Yeah, I can hear it. So, first I'm going to show you what we put on this park. And it, again, it was based on the input we were giving from your staff and from public meetings. And then probably a little more interestingly, I'll tell you why. And so, to begin with, first of all, I have the magic pen that I can point to this stuff with. Let's start here, on the highway. When you're going either direction on the highway, there is a series of announcements that begin to happen. Things begin to happen to you as you're passing on the car to let you know that something's changed here and begin to set up the process of entering the park. Starting here, there's actually the first major thing that will happen. You have a gateway that takes you into the lower part of the park. In the lower part of the park, actually the upper part of the park, sorry. In the upper part of the park, there is a parking lot. While it may look a little oversized, it actually, whether or not it's the right size, it's predominantly there to serve two purposes. One of them is rec center. The other is amphitheater. You can see that there is a direct passage to the amphitheater area as well as a direct passage to the rec center area. Um, and just to get ahead of myself a little bit, there's also a what may appear to be an oversized parking lot in the Hazelit area, which also serves the same purpose. All of the activities that occur there as well as the amphitheater. So as you come in, and park here, then a number of activities occur to you. There is a stream bed, whether or not it's actually a running stream, I show it as blue, but it is a intimation of a, spring, of a stream for the purpose of nature play. Um, it also serves to help drain the park. Then there is a series of play pods, including skateboard, educational play, nature play, and probably child's play, which lead all the way up to the upper part of the park, a center shelter restroom area, and then your recreation center. We've divided the recreation center into phase one and phase two. Above that are fields that you already exist. You already have these. And let me come here. I'll go by you. I'm going to sneak by here. Okay. 
Right now the fields are such that this backstop sits down here. The downside of that is it's actually in the low end of the drainage so that a lot of the water that's draining off of that is draining into the infield area. Not ideal, so fortunately we can move it to above and therefore have it drain correctly and at the same time provide more area within the recreation center park for those uses. This is a existing grove of trees which would provide an ideal natural play area. To jump around a little bit, this is a drawing that we were given by the school district. And so we simply placed it as they drew it for an expansion that they wished to do. But fortunately, the way that they parked it also adds additional parking for both the park and the recreation center. That shared parking is extremely important. As this project moves forward, you'll begin to analyze all of these parking spaces. And in my guess, you may likely reduce them. There's probably a little more parking that's necessary shown right now. As we go across, one of the more important things occurs right here. This is what we're recommending as a tunnel under the road. What would occur is this becomes a bit of a valley, which it does not exist now, and which would take this point to almost equal to the point on the bay side of the road so that all of a sudden this park and this park became one pedestrian area where all the activities are shared between them. There would be a boathouse, the amphitheater which we have talked to, more open green, the beach area, and boat docking. Finally, on the Hazelit pro property, there's a lot of other activities, and I'll move back now. There's a lot of other activities that will occur. This is an activated park, if you will. It has tennis courts, pickleball, BMX pump track, trails including disc golf trails. It has a day camp center including a restroom and shelter and it has an outer paved trail for outside walking. Any questions so far? That's basically what we're recommending in the park, what the program that we've all developed together. Go to the next one. If I may, I'll explain why we've gone, why the team has come to this point. This is how your bay started. Maybe not started, but in more modern times, this is largely what it was used for, which was summer boating, summer swimming, activity gathering. It was a gathering space for this part of Vermont. Go to the next one, Tom. This is largely what it looked like. I don't know what year this is. Anybody have a guess? 30? 30s, 40s. 30s, 40s, yeah, that would be my guess. It looks like that. Obviously, it's changed in ensuing years, but that's what it be. That's how it started. Go to the next one. So let's talk about how and why parks work. Why did people go to these summer camps in the summer every year? They go to those summer camps for the same reason they go to the park. Anybody want to hazard a guess what the number one reason to go to the park is? To meet people. Who said that? Bingo. People go to the park because it's a social gathering space. The same reason they went there. So when you begin to think about designing a park, physical activity is 10% of recreation. Imagination is another 10%. The rest of it, the rest of the 80% is actually socialization. That's the kind of people we are. That's why people go to a park. So what do we do as we begin to develop this park? First thing we do is we invite them. You invite people into the park. You begin to notify them that there's a park occurring from your car, and then you bring them into the park, and you do it in a way that is clear. Obviously, this is a pretty big invitation into a park. It's amazing how successful it is. As people move into the park, you want them to change the way they feel about their daily lives. They're moving into a recreation space. Go to the next one. This is another example, a little smaller. It's in a mountain town. A Artistic Elkhorn, it again invites people into the park. It changes their day. Go to the next one. 
As you move through a drive into the park, classic things begin to happen. One of the important things is what your terminal view is. This is a very natural park that we're looking at, but this line of trees helps begin to set up the precedent for what you're going to do in this park. Go to the next one, Tom. One of the other things that begins to happen is moving from the automobile into the pedestrian because that's one of the important things that happens in a park. We do not recreate in our cars, not in parks. And so setting it up so people move seamlessly from their automobile to a pedestrian is one of the more important things. Hands down, throughout the United States, five times any other recreational activity, walking is the number one recreational activity. When you recognize that and begin to set it up so that people can do that, in a way that allows them to be with their families and friends, you've already begun the basis of a successful park. Go to the next one. Make sure that every point in your park is accessible, but do not make every walk accessible. Make each walk different so that there's an experiential thing that happens as you walk through the park. Some of them are too steep and some of them are shallow. But the po every point in the park should be accessible, meaning one way's hard, one way's easy. Next one. More importantly, maybe the most important thing in any walk is don't just have people go from point A to point B. Create a set of experiences along the walk so that as you're moving through the walk, there is something you can do, something you can talk about, something to keep your interest. Because as you're doing that experience, you're usually sharing it with somebody or heading back to where your family is. This one is a great one. This is a walk that has five things happening on it. On this, these stones have words written and they're the geology of the site. This is a story that a, is a child's story. On the next one is what the weather patterns are that occur around the site. And the fourth site is actually, who knows what QR is? It's a changing story. And you go up and you put your QR on it, and it can be whatever the Parks Department wants that week or whatever they're asked to do, so that all of a sudden you have a reason to do this again and again as your family is doing other activities in the park. Go to the next one. Oh, let me show you something. Go back. Go back. If you notice, this walk goes out of sight. That's really important in a walk. What you want to do is move through a series of spaces. You do not want any space in this park visible. I'm sorry, let me say that again. You do not want any place in this park where every space in the park is visible. When you can ex access the whole park, it diminishes it. This is a very, actually a seven acre park. I challenge you to tell me it's not 20 when you move through it because there's so many rooms that you move through and so many things happen. Go to the next one. This is probably the most important thing that you should do. In this park, it wasn't even necessary. This, this is an overpass, a garden overpass, and this is a gateway between the two, two of the rooms. On this side is passive play, passive play, hillsides, shelters. On the other side is active play, a, a football field, play area. But picture this, if you will between Upper Bayside Park and the bay. All of a sudden, it's one park, not two parks separated by a highway. It may be the most important thing you can do to create a single park in that site, and it deserves it. It's such a great site. Go to the next one. This is some examples of amphitheaters. This is a mix of grass and stone. There's dozens of these stone outcroppings in this grassy field. And at the bottom, there's a stage. So this is a way to have a natural amphitheater. You remember the one that we showed at the, at the park. This would be much like that. Go on to the next one. Here's some examples of a little more refined uh, park. I believe this was in Telluride, Colorado. And then go to the next one. This is actually even more refined. And one of the cool things about this one is it's also a drainage cleansing area. The drainage for this area moves in its attention pond, these cattails clean it as it moves out, and the rest of the time it's a nature learning area. Or you could have a Shakespearean play. 
you guys probably know that all Shakespearean plays were originally done outdoors. And so in a Shakespearean grove. Go to the next one. So when you build shelters, we recommend don't build a shelter. Build five. Build a village of shelters. Build shelters so that you can rent this one, or these two, or the whole thing for your company, or you have a variety of ways that you can maximize the use for your income, as well as, more importantly, meeting the needs of the community. And it also just creates a different kind of space to have a series of shelters, a village of shelters, if you will, rather than a shelter stuck in the middle. Go to the next one. This is a great example. This is one, two, three shelters. They're all three different sizes. This one's actually bisected by a little creek. So you can rent either the whole space or use part of it based on the size of your group. Go to the next one. Why are we creating a village of shelters and plazas? It's to gather people, put people in one place, to create a center to your park. And that's one of the most important things you can do. Because from that center, this is a nature play area. This area right here is a water play area. This area over here is actually fields, right? I'm standing on a hilltop. What happens is from the center spot, a whole variety of things begin to radiate. Why would you do that? The reason is because people go to the park differently than they used to. When we were kids, your mother would say, go to the park, be home by dinner. Nobody does that anymore. They go as families. They go as groups of neighborhoods. For whatever reason, we've changed society, and now we go in groups. So what's the average length of time people will stay at the park? There's two determinants in my experience. One is the length of time it takes to read a golf magazine, and the second is the length of time between when kids have to go potty. One of those two things are going to send you home. So if you give everybody something to do, everybody in the family, all of a sudden the length of time that you stay in your park is dramatically increased. And the more people that stay longer in your park, guess what happens? The more people go to your park. Because keep in mind, the reason we all go there is to be with other people. We could all go off and ride our bike by ourselves and do. But when we go to the park, we're going to the park so that we can be with each other. And so if you design a park for social reasons, all of a sudden you have a successful park. Go to the next one. So families have changed. The number of families in America that are two parents and children is 20% today. That's an amazing statistic. So what do the rest of the families look like? Well, a lot of them look like this. Two generations ago, dogs were farm animals. Now they live with us. And it is very important, in my experience, to include them in your park experience, in your recreation experience. You remember my reasoning, and I'll tell you why. Why are they so important? If we go to the park for recreational reasons, for social reasons, and I come up to you and say, I'm here to socialize, how about you? That just doesn't work so well. But if I go up to you and say, that's a really cute dog. It is downright the best icebreaker you can have. And people also are there, they bring their family, and that's one of their family. May not be yours, may not be theirs, but it is truly people's family. Go to the next one. I love this slide. Look where all the dogs are, and look where all the peoples are. People don't take their dog park to the do dogs to the dog park for the dogs. They're up there doing what they do. They're socializing, as are the dogs, separately. It's a really, again, our society is not doing well at creating social spaces. Parks are one of our best opportunities, and if we do them right and design them as such, we can really have success. And there's, I've seldom seen a site better than Bayside for accomplishing that. Go to the next one. So, we talked about walks. This is the seven acre park that I'll challenge you to tell me isn't 20. You can see where all the walks come and go. This is one of the little, my little magic button, little kiosks that happen. The walks go out of sight. They go all around this topography. Guess what? When I moved onto that park, it was dead flat. Every bit of that topography was created. Why would you do that? Why would you move so much ground? When if you look at most parks, they're dead flat. 
People must want him dead flat. I don't think so. I think Uncle Joe builds most of the parks. And he just has a tractor and that's what he does. But if you're actually creating social spaces and spaces where people can walk. In this park, I'm, I'm standing on that hillside, you remember above the, above the uh, underpass? And behind me there's a playground. There is a series of walks that go throughout this park, around back behind here, around here. And you can walk a mile and never be more than 50 yards from your children in that playground. You can go through these series of loops, or you can take two of them and you did a quarter mile, or you can take three of them and you did three quarters of a mile, or you can take an extra loop and you did two miles, and you're never more than 100 yards in two miles from your family. So you can do the number one activity for adults and people in their, all ages, and still everybody's gathered together doing different things. Go to the next one. So now we play different. How many people ever heard a book called Last Child in the Woods? Nature Deficit, it was a very famous, oh good, good one guy. So it's the worst book ever written. I've tried to read it and couldn't, but it had the right idea. It's called Nature Deficit Disorder. People, kids do not get out in nature, people do not get out in nature again, and it actually changes our personality. And so we started designing parks differently. Go to the next one. One thing, and again, let, let me move back to something else right now. Hands down, the best water is not a pool. The best water is water play. Do you think people were swimming laps in the bay back in 1930? No, they were splashing around and pushing each other off that dock and playing in the water. And so if they knew how to do this, this is what they do. But now we know how to do this. And I highly recommend that you make this part of your indoor and outdoor experience in this park. Go to the next one. We like to say we want every mom to go home mad. Her kids are wet, dirty, they have a salamander in their pocket, and they learned and played the way that we wished we could play. We have sterilized our parks to the point that we have nature disor disorder. So when you design a park, design it so mom is pissed. I'm going home, I gotta wash the clothes. What I go to that park and next week kids say, can we go back where the salamander? Go to the next one. <coughs> Bikes. This is called a pump track. This is one of my favorite pictures because the little girl has a dirty bottom. She obviously fell, but she's keeping going. She's learning skills. She's learning skills that you can only learn in a place like this. And it's one of the reasons, again, just like dog park, we say put a bike park in there, put a skills course for adults and kids alike. Multi-generational play is what's most important. And if you put skills courses in there that challenge you all the way from the little kid with no pedal who's walking his bike to the adult who's just learning how to ride a, an off-road bike. All of a sudden, everybody's out there getting better, and then they'll move out into the bigger trails. But in the meantime, somebody can sit there when they're done with the golf course magazine and perfect their skills while the kids are playing and mom's walking and somebody else is doing something else, or dad's walking and mom's up there chasing this girl. Go next. Another great exercise multi-generation. When I first started building skate parks 20 years ago, people all said, those are gonna be terrible. There's gonna be kids there, they're gonna be cussing and smoking cigarettes and painting on the skate parks, and they were right. That's 20 years ago. Those people are now 40 years old, have their own kids, and they're out there teaching them how to ride skateboards. That generation moved on, as all do, and now it's become a great multi-generational place for kids to go and play and adults to go and teach them how they play. Go to the next one. This is one of my favorite slides ever. I call it tomorrow's select board. <laughs> <laughs> if the number one thing that we're learning in, is socialization, the number one place that these guys can learn it is right here. And it's one of the best places we learn it because we're relaxed. You know, have our uh, tight and you know, dignified, we can actually let our guard down a little bit and actually play as adults. And it teaches them how to be tomorrow's select board. Something about the way he's doing it just makes me <laughs> love it. Oh, come on, come on, if we just did this, I don't know. <laughs> Go to the next one. So, 
imagination. That's 10%, and that's a really important 10%. This is in Fossil Creek Park in Fort Collins, Colorado. When we were digging the foundation for this, guess what we found? A tusk, a mammoth tusk, right there under it. Probably why it's called Fossil Creek. Creating an image around your park that nobody else had, that captures the imagination of everybody. Everybody wants next to socialization, they want a story. Give people a story. Give them a story that goes around the loop and give them a story. Give me the next slide. You have the perfect story. <laughs> <laughs> you need to tell this story. This morning I went for a drive and I ended up in Canada. But along the way, I stopped in. <laughs> yeah, it did. It's not very far to Canada, actually. But along the way, I stopped in at a tourist place. And I'm sitting there talking to the lady, and I see this on the walls. And I've heard of Champ before. I go over and start reading it. And I thought, oh my gosh, everybody who's not, you guys think I have heard that all my life. But not everybody's heard that. Not just like the, the mammoth tusk. That's a great story. Tell them the story. Make it part of the park. Teach the kids this is part of your culture. How many people know that Champlain was actually the first guy that saw it? And it was recorded back in 16-something. That was so cool. And everybody wants that story. Go to the next one. Regular play equipment. We don't use a lot of it because we think there's a lot better play out there. This is the best play thing ever. It looks like a teepee. You see the young ladies in here having a teepee council. It is a climber, and it spins. That hands down on a playground, more people use that, more kids, more adults, everybody uses that because it has a little bit of everything. There are many toys like that. And as I told the staff today, one of the most important things you can do with your kids and grandkids is spin them. You know why? You know this movement here? There's an inner ear connection that is only made with that movement, and it increases balance. So anytime you do a part, put a spin right there. These don't go fast, but it's still moving. They like it. Give me the next slide. OK, are you the Green Mountain State or what? This is what everybody wants. Besides socialization and besides a story, this is a story. This is a climbing wall that tells them about their state. Give an education with every plaything you do. Give socialization, give imagination, give a story. Give them something to learn. And this was actually designed by a championship climber who can climb this. And then anybody can climb, not anybody, but most people can climb that. Great multi-generational. Adults will let their dignity down to climb their state and show this guy's grandfather wouldn't let me take his picture, but he climbed it. Go. This is Better Stories. This is a little town in Rifle, Colorado. What a great name, Rifle, Colorado. Uh, as we went through the town and designed this park, there's a series of stories that happened. It talked about what happened in Rifle, Colorado in 1910, in 1890, and 1920 and 1940 and 2012. And not only did it tell what happened in Rifle, Colorado, but it told what was happening in the world at the same time. This is what kind of airplanes just began to fly. Here's when cars came. Here's what the dances and the music were. Those stories were really important. I've seen generations using them as they do the walks. It increases the chance that people will come together. This will tell you everything from what time of day it is, to what the month is, what the moon phase is, what the Pleiades are doing at that particular time. Again, that level of education everybody can use. Go to the next one. I'm probably going on too long. <laughs> this was a hat built in 1940, a sombrero, if you will. It was a slide. The National Playground Safety Council told us we had to tear it down because it did not meet National Playground Safety Council standards we couldn't bear to do it, and the neighborhood so supported it. So we came in and made it art. It is not a slide now. If you use it as a slide, that's at your own risk, but it's a art. It's called the Sleeping Cowboy. And right over here is the beginning of the story. Once upon a time, a giant cowboy roamed this land, 
dot, dot, dot. You don't tell the whole story. You let them figure that out. It is, it's a great, and we got to keep the hat. It's not a slide, it's art. Go next. Okay, so let's talk about what happens here. That's what's important. Picture this, if you will, as a passage. So this is now one part, top to bottom. Right here are climbing walls. And in order to have a climbing wall, it has to come above grade because when you're on top of it, you have to have safety. So as you drive through here, all of a sudden the road narrows because there's two rails on each side. Not rail, but climbing walls. Something happened. You know something's happening. When the road does this on the edge of it, all of a sudden you recognize that something's happening. And then there's a gateway. Maybe not unlike the gateways you saw. And the second more important thing, right here there's a monument. Why would you put a monument right there? That seems remote. You turn the corner, you go through that gateway, and there's something you're looking at. And that something reflects what this space is about. I don't know what it is yet. Maybe it's champ, I don't know. It's something that's important. Then you turn away, and there's no parking on the outside of this parking lot for two reasons. You turn away and you see the park, and your eye goes right up this little creek, so it begins to reveal what kind of park it is. More importantly, food truck day. On food truck day, that outside loop is lined with food truck. The more you can do to bring people there, the better. Whatever it is. Food trucks, I don't know. Then you turn back in park and you begin your park experience. Your park experience centers around, if you will, the village. That's the village of shelters. It's not this building. It's really important where this building is. I don't, you guys may not know, but there's a grade break right there. One of the more important things about that recreation center is to be visible to the road. When that recreation center sits right there, it's not imposing to the road, but it is a Jeffersonian building on the hill, so it invites people. It's part of that whole progressive invitation. Once you're here, there's water moving through the park. Maybe it's being cleansed here, which is all part of that, you know, maybe it's cattail, all part of that experience of water, education, nature. You have all of the facilities we talked about, including a series of play, skate park. You walk by the parking lot up through here, dog park right there on the edge of the woods. If you look how everything kind of comes to a point right here, even the athletic fields, which are shared with the school, are accessible. Why would you have everything come to a point right there? Because so many people are centering their activities radially from the park center. Everybody has something to do, including a series of walks. Everybody has a walk they can take, and nobody has to get too far. As you move down through here, and you come under this awesome tunnel, and you saw how big the tunnel was. This wasn't a tunnel. This is a passage. May even have the drainage from the park moving through it. As you move through here, you come to the lake house. One thing that we were told is that you need to bring boats into the shore to have a place they can have a bath, they can play cards, they can buy concessions. And if we do it well, they can move right up into all kinds of activities, including your recreation center. What do you guys call this one? Community, community center. <laughs> Include, there's a few words for it. Including your community center. You're creating a whole space, and it is inviting you step by step. Whether you're in a boat, whether you're in a car, whether you came on a bike, you're invited step by step through the space. Down here, you have a pretty big green, the boathouse or lake house, if you will, the beach, the amphitheater, and the dock. There's a lot of stuff happening right there. And then, of course, it's really, I really believe it becomes visibly part of what the whole park is about. Partly when you're standing here, you can actually see across the road and up there. You're invited to move on through it. This was cleverly located so that as you drive into here, you see right to the entry. 
Can you see that? The road tells you where to go. Before you get there, you turn off and you park here, you turn off and you park here, but you know where to go. And the angle of this building with its big green, I'm sorry, big glass atrium right here, looks straight down across the boathouse and out to the bay. That's on purpose. And again, is that subliminal tying all these spaces together. And when you're looking for year-round use, this big greenhouse, this big atrium, glass atrium, is going to be really important. It's going to move into spaces outdoors. This is part of the transitional space where from your water play, water actually runs through your village of shelters, down through the play, across the park, into the nature area. You can begin to see how everything's tied together both naturally and with walks and drives. Any questions? God, just, you're wrapped, I can tell. Okay. Finally. Axel, can you just specify the BMX course is a non-motorized vehicle? It's a non-motorized vehicle course. This right here is the BMX course. And again, it is a place, we call it a BMX course. A lot of people call them pump tracks these days. It has everything from logs that you walk across to rocks that you jump to actually elevated uh, trestles that, you, that people with greater skill can do. And if any of you are an orthopedic surgeon, they help those people out. And so they, it's, they do a whole variety of things to improve people's skills at a level they like and then move on. Non-motorized, it, it would be clearly labeled as such. But it's not off by itself. It, it's here. But what happens is, then you have walking trails that surround it and all the other activities. You have pickleball, tennis. You have a camp shelter with the camp meadow and the camp woods. So that there's a variety. When I say camp, I mean summer camps. You're not gonna, you don't put your tent or your mobile home there. It's, it's a place that you, that you take kids. And then natural areas, areas that are just kind of left alone. A natural area here and a natural area here. We looked hard at that beach side. It's very steep. It's dauntingly steep. So it's good to have that as a natural beach edge. Probably not very usable. So it's, it's a view. It's a natural reserve, if you will. Parking for everything. And again, that same entry that tells you that something's happened as you move through this space. Same kind of, you pass under or through something, and at the end of your view, there's a monument. Then past the monument, you see the shelter and the whole park, but then you turn away from it. All that is not just happening. That is a series of events that happen as you move into the space. Any space you move into, like your own house, when you go from the street to the front yard to the door to the anteroom, all of those are helping people move from the outside to the inside. Doing the same thing with these rooms, moving them into a space that's different where they've been. What did I miss, Don? I think you've done a great job, actually. Eventually, there's a possibility of a road through here. It's not part of this park, but there's been land set aside for it for access to the park and relief to the road. Uh, disc golf occurs in here. I meant to mention that. Yeah. And then, of course, this walk, which invites people here to park, allows them to see what a great place this is to recreate and then takes them on down for the summer concert. Axel, maybe touch on, from the team's perspective, why the community center location was chosen for Upper Bayside as opposed to Bayside Hazlet. OK, so the most important thing, just like any retailer, and just to be honest with you, you are retailing your recreation center, your community center. You want it to feel safe, accessible, and invitational. This location right here was chosen specifically because it sat on a rise in the hill, so it is quite visible. It's a Jeffersonian location, if you will. Thomas Jefferson was an architect, and he would place his buildings on rises. So you could see them, and there was green up to them. It created a feeling of, of open pastoralness, if pastoralness is a word. There's any teacher here that can tell me it wasn't. But 
an open pasture up to the building. And that's why, Don, it's so important to put it here. Hazel, it's a beautiful site for a lot of the things we're using, but there's only a tiny little view corridor right there. I don't think you would ever be able to see in there and have any sort of invitation from the road. So I think that's the main reason so that this visibility is so clear.